The knobby blouse. What is it? Why is it called that? And most importantly, how do you make one? All this and more in the latest part of my 1896 outfit on my 1896 sewing machine project. In the late 19th century, there was an explosion in women entering the workforce with the Industrial Revolution and women being able to do factory work as well as domestic labour. A big symbol of this shift was the changes in fashion and women would need a professional attire to wear to their work, workrooms and uh, factories, something that was professional but also still adhered to the social constructs of the time. Out of this evolved the shirtwaist or the nubby blouse. The shirtwaist grew out of men's fashion, the standard men's shirt, but was altered to fit the Victorian female ideal and the later Edwardian uh, pigeon-breasted, floofy, elegant outfits. And most of this work is done with gathers and pin tucks, ruffles, and a lot of different variations of the shirtwaist became popular. You had the standard more shirt looking shirtwaist which might just have some gathers, nice little collar, some poofy sleeves, or you could have incredibly adorned blouses with insertion lace and honeycomb smocking, huge collars, loads of lace. For the first time in history, working women were the inspiration for the normal fashion which is incredible that the amount of women that were in work and leading the fashion became so prevalent that even upper class women who didn't work would be wearing these outfits as a bottom-up fashion trend rather than a top-down now it was working women's turn oh i might want to define nobby sorry yeah i've just like been talking about <laughs> nobby the word just means fashionable it is the fashionable blouse uh, it's kind of similar to the word snobby but it has like positive connotations instead of negative shout out to enola holmes too and their nobby hats on <laughs> today i'm actually using a pre-made pattern uh, instead of drafting my own it is because i am doing a workshop and i am going to be teaching people how to create this blouse and I want to test out this pattern um, so that I know the ins and outs of it before I teach other people how to make uh, blouses. One good thing about this pattern is that it comes in a wide range of sizes so it's easy to alter to what you need. This pattern is the oh, truly Victorian uh, countryside blouse 1908 so it's a little bit later than the 1896 but since it's a countryside one fashions don't change as fast in the countryside but it will still have the same kind of vibe as the, the early uh, nobby blouses the early shirt waists and i'm gonna add a little bit of my own kind of sprinkle in it i'm gonna do some insertion lace you know have a bit of fun with it let's not get drafting let's get cutting Just needing to iron my fabric because it's been lying in a ball for uh, since last year, so. And then I am just going to pin and mark my pattern before cutting it out in the fabric. This is the right hand side front and I've laid it with the front down and then I'm going to do the placket. So first round is 
turning that guy over. I think that one lies at about half an inch. Then fold over at the second line. And then I'm going to stitch here. Then I'm just flipping the placket to the outside and then from the outside top stitching it down on the side like that. Mm -hmm. Alright and then I've got the front of the placket, this is what it looks like on the back and then I'm going to do the other side. So I'm now doing the left side and I've laid it with the wrong side facing upwards and then I am going to fold along the first mark. So I've folded this guy and ironed, then I am doing another fold that's one quarter of an, no, one eighth of an inch further out than the, the line marked and that makes this one seven eighths of an inch wide so I'm gonna fold that and then I'm gonna iron that as well so basically then I just fold one inch away from the edge and then I'm gonna press that and then I'm gonna sew along here with the top stitch Right, and now we've got the left and the right side. So you can see how that's the left side. And then this one will be going over like that. But that's uh, for later. And we're going to be doing that after. Because I want to be a very fashionable lady, um, I am going to use some insertion lace to create some nice character to this piece. Now the insertion lace needs to be done before the garment is put together because otherwise it gets really awkward um, to do it. So basically what you do, I'm just gonna, so I will lay down some lace like that. I'm wanting to have some kind of running parallel on the front pieces. Uh, because I think that's a really nice look and uh, just have like a couple down I think so I'm going to just pin it and I'm just measuring between the lace to make sure that they're evenly spaced and pinning them just straight on top of the outside of the front of the garment. And then I'm just top stitching each side of the insertion lace down. And then I'm flipping it on the back side and in the middle part of the seam 
I'm just snipping down the middle, being very careful not to catch the lace. And then I've just tucked in the seam allowance and ironed so that it's all like neat. And then I'm stitching down the seam allowance. And voila! Insertion lace. Right, so I'm gonna do the insertion lace on the cuffs. I think I want just like a little band around the wrist um, but because the cuff is two layers I think I'm going to put an insertion into like each of the layers Now for the cuffs, I am not going to fold in the seam allowance just because there's two pieces and I'm going to turn them inside out and then I'm going to stitch them together later. So the seam allowance is going to be on the inside anyways. But I think I am going to trim the seam allowance just so it looks a bit nicer. All right. So insertion lace is in and that means that I can start putting stuff together. Yeah, okay. So gather the front, gather the top here, gather a little bit at the waist here. Now you can do this on the sheen, but I can't be arsed changing the stitch length on my 1896 machine because to be honest that it takes ages, it's not as easy as just pushing a button like a modern machine. Um, if you were to do it by machine, I would do about stitch length five. Um, make sure not to fasten the thread because otherwise you're going to have difficulties gathering the gathers. All right. But you know, if you're doing it by hand, you can add a little knot at the end of the thread. I'm just going to go from here just so I have a little space to do the seam allowance. And then I just do basically a basting stitch. <laughs> um, sir? There we go. I'm just leaving the threads here loose for now. I'm gonna fasten them later because um, my old timey machine doesn't do, um, it doesn't do fastening, like it doesn't do a back stitch, so I have to fasten them by hand. But sometimes you could just stitch over them and since this is going to be into the yoke, I'm just gonna stitch over them and then trim them afterwards. That means I don't have to fasten each individual little thread because they're going to be stitched over. And then the second line just a little bit below the first one. And then you basically just hold the two threads and pull. And then that creates the gathers. And you do the exact same if you do it on the machine. Just make sure to only pick the top two threads or the bottom two threads and you can do the exact same thing, just pull. All right. Okay, so I've got the two pieces of the yoke here. Let's see, I'll start with one piece. Da, da, da. Okay. So here's the front and 
then I'm gonna adjust the gathers to fit. Like, fit here. I'm just gonna pin on each side and then so many threads. <laughs> then I'm just gonna make the gathers lie all nice. All right, and then the other piece of the yoke goes on top, and then the gathers are sandwiched in between. And then I'm going to do the same on the other side, and then I'm just going to stitch across all three layers here. Then I'm just going to trim the seam lines on the inside and yeah iron it iron it nice and flat upwards and I'm going to fasten the threads first so I don't forget okie dokie so I am gonna fasten the back piece to the top yoke yeah cool Middle here, a little bit more gathers towards the middle of the back. And then the inside of the yoke, the lining, is just flipped underneath and top stitched. So I've got two collar band pieces and I'm just stitching a line half an inch on from the neck on one of them by the way this is also a good time to do a fitting to see if you know the neck band is big enough or small enough um, if the shoulders sit where they should you know stuff like that just basically just pop it on and have a little feel, you know? And then I'm going to pop that one on top of that and then just stitch around here to create the little neck band. So Now I just need to see. Trim off the exit seam allowance here. Right, so I've got my color and then I'm just gonna pin it around the neckline. I'm gonna try not to catch the the inside, the, the turned over edge in the seam. Just try to push that away so it doesn't get caught. And there's a little bit of ease in this because it's got a curve around. So. All right. Then that's all pinned. And then I'm gonna 
with my friction marker just mark the seam allowance because it's hard to see on the old timey machine where the seam allowance is because I can't really use anything to measure. Most modern machines have like a little, here is half an inch on it. But... Oh. All right, stitchy time. And I'm just taking it slowly because sewing uh, an almost straight to a curve is quite awkward and you can't sew it making you make it straight you have to make the straight circular curved if that makes sense that's one side and then I'm gonna just trim this a little bit because it looks kind of not very nice. Be careful not to cut the collar. Right, and I'm just gonna do a few teeny tiny little snips here not past the thread, just in the seam allowance here. That helps the ease of that seam uh, so it doesn't crumble as much. All right, and then just tuck the seam allowance in and put the already folded edge over. Right, right, okay. Now you can either stitch this from the inside or the outside. It doesn't really matter, um, but if you stitch it from the outside, you are able to control the seam, how it looks on the outside. But I've just pinned it to the inside, so I'm gonna go for the inside, since this is just a, a little mock, a little trial piece. But I would recommend going from the top side and just, just so you have a little bit more control of where the stitching line goes. A little top stitch. All right, ta-da. Then we've got, a collar. It needs a little bit of an iron. Right, now you can see it. Obviously this is a mock-up, so it's gonna look a little bit nicer. But yeah, hopefully that's a good explanation. All right, we've got the color on, and then it's time for the side seams. Now, I'm gonna do a French seam for the side seams, and at first, I'm gonna sew a small seam allowance with the seam allowance turning to the outside, and then I'm going to flip that around and then stitch with the slightly bigger seam allowance to the inside, so that the second stitch hides the edges of the fabric.
Now I'm going to do the little sleeve, sleeve placket thingy. Right, and I think first off I need to, I just realised I've done the, <laughs> the markings in the resistant pen. But obviously that's going to disappear instantly. Oh well. All right, okay, we'll just, just follow what the thingy says. There. Immediately gone, whoops. Okay, so that's that one. That guy goes. There, question mark? I guess. Try that. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I think, I think I've got it. Okay, and then. Okay. <laughs> so I think I need to stitch along here through both sides and then cut up here and then flip it inside out. Let's do that. Just stitching down the stitch line that I've drawn and this is from the inside of the sleeve and I'm just stitching that little square U shape around where the where we'll snip and then I'm turning the sleeve with the right side out and I've snipped up the little uh, slash and I'm now using the lines that I ironed earlier to kind of figure out where the placket goes so just like folding the lines making it fit And then I'm just stitching down the little under placket of the placket, if that makes sense. And then I am stitching from the bottom all the way up to the top along the placket, uh, that little kind of house shape that goes all the way around the top and then across. To create the, the placket placket and that's the placket's finished and then I've just French seamed together the sleeves the exact same way that I did the side seams well easier to do this without my huge jumper but oh well gonna be like that and then just pop, pop that in Shoop. and then I'm gonna line up the seam of the sleeve with the side seam because that seems to be where it fits perfectly okay. and then I'm gonna pin halfway up I think the armhole and uh, then I'm gonna do a little gathering thread across the top of the sleeve. Ew! I stabbed myself. 
hopefully you won't get blood on my white shirt that would be kind of sad and then I'm gonna run just a little gathering thread along the top I can make this one nice and little stitches because I can't be arsed making two rows so this is just gonna be one row so I need it to be perfectly pretty something funny about taking twice as long to make one row instead of making two rows because I my brain thinks that's better I, I guess all right okay I'm gonna be doing a basing stitch around the sleeve because I'm gonna be a good boy and just make sure that the sleeves are in correctly and also it makes it easier to stitch later on all right it's starting to look like an actual shirt I think the sleeves are correct in. Plackets on the outside. I'm just gathering the bottom of the sleeves so that they fit the size of the cuffs. So I've marked an inch up on each of the cuffs and I'm going to be ironing that so that it will be easier to insert the cuffs later on. And after I've done that, I am just stitching around the cuffs, snipping the seam allowance and turning them inside out and then they're ready to attach. I got my camera back. Uh, it's been charging. I had to go and buy more thread because I only had beige thread and I'm gonna do top stitching and I don't want beige top stitching. And I'm just top stitching each side of the insertion lace so that that stays nice and just in place. I'm gonna pop a pin on each side of the cuff. And then I'm just gonna tighten the gathers until they fit the cuff. So. Uh, I've gathered the gathers on the cuff to fit the cuff. So I'm just gonna stitch here, flip it over, stitch again. And then I'm just going to flip that over and I'm going to pin from the top side just to make sure that it looks nice on the outside. It's the most important, looking nice on the outside, not the inside, the opposite of people. gonna fasten the thread at the end here. All the other threads are either tucked in or in the seam. So it's just these two that aren't one on each side that's sticking out. <laughs> All right, a back band. So it's this little, this little guy. And basically, I'm just folding in the edges. What oh, size does that guy have? Half an inch, but I don't think it matters too much. <laughs> All right. 
ge. So the pattern says to make your own band, but I've got perfectly fine cotton tape, so I'm going to be using that instead. And I'm just taking a length, measuring around my waist, basically just pulling it around my waist and enough to make a little bow. Snip. Then just finding the midpoint and marking that. And then I am just pulling the gathering threads that I made on the mid back earlier so that they fit the size of the little band, the little outer band, I guess. And then I am placing the waistband and then the outer little like protection band, I guess, uh, and pinning that just straight on top of the gathers. Nice and just pinning it all nicely in place and making the gathers look all nice. And then I'm just going to stitch around that. And then I'm just going to hem this guy. I'm just going to tidy up the bottom edge first. And all of these threads are going to be locked in the hem so I don't need to worry about fastening them and then I'm just gonna do a little hem I'm gonna finish off the armholes now because uh, they look quite sad and that's gonna you know be an issue if I need to wash it so you could just if you have an overlocker overlock around here it's the easiest one. You could zigzag, you could hand fill it just like that. But I'm gonna do the Victorian method that they use quite a lot of using some cotton tape. And then I'm gonna stitch it on just above the stitching line there. And then I am going to trim the seam allowance fold it over and then stitch it down by hand on the other side. All right, so I have put the tape on and I'm now just gonna trim the seam allowance a bit just so it's not super bulky. Very careful not to cut anything but the seam allowance. Okay, and then I'll just flop that over and lay that all the way down to the seam allowance. I might actually not need to do this by hand. I could probably just do this by machine. I'm pinning it like that. Look how nice they that inside armhole seam is. Right. <laughs> so you might have noticed that I've done <laughs> a couple already. And um, that's because uh, usually when I do buttonholes, they're really ugly at the beginning. And I'm like, I don't really want to do a close up of an ugly one. So <laughs> that's why. So hopefully now towards uh, the end of this row, I'll be able to show you a nice buttonhole. We'll see. <laughs> but basically, to make a handmade buttonhole, what I do is I bring the thread up from underneath so the knot is on the back, make a little tiny little knot, then I'll do a couple stitches across here, just across the little stitch there. The little line. I do a little running stitch just to the underside. And then I do a couple stitches across the other side. 
it's important that the sides are kind of strong uh, because that's what's going to take the most tension. And then I do a little running stitch on the other side. And then I just let the, the thread be there for a moment while I use my little tiny scissors. And I start from the middle of the buttonhole and snip all the way out to the tack there. I don't go through the tack, don't want to ruin my little tack there. And then I anchor the thread behind the tack line, pull the needle through there, the thread across there, pull and making sure the knot goes to the outside, I guess the, the inside of the buttonhole. And then I just continue doing that, making sure to anchor it behind the stitch line that I've made already and not pulling too hard but also not you know leaving too much slack <laughs> so I thought we should do a tiny little wrap up. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm really quite happy with it. I'm really, really happy with the insertion lace, even though this one turned out a little bit askew, but that's fine. Can you see? Can you tell? No, you can't. <laughs> I also like, I don't know if it's the pattern or if I did it wrong, but the cuffs seem to be going the wrong way. Like usually the cuffs go away from the front. Am I just like... So apparently 2023 is the year of camera issues because the files became corrupted. So you're just going to have to deal with some voiceover outro. But you get to see this sweet little spinning mannequin of the blouse while I'm talking. I actually realized what I did wrong with the cuffs. I put the wrong sleeve in the wrong sleeve, which is embarrassing, but we've all done that, right? <laughs> all in all, I am actually really happy with this. I love these kind of blouses. They're just iconic, just a staple of the late 1800s and early 1900s. Just really iconic. 
and I'm hoping you enjoyed this video. You know, if you liked it, you could leave a like, you could leave a comment, you could leave a subscribe. I appreciate every one of you. I guess it's a little bit late to say Happy New Year, but Happy New Year. And hopefully I'll get to make loads of videos in the new year. Okay, thank you. Bye.